Hi, this is Ivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Eva Pilgrim is the author of Walter Does His Best, A Frenchy Adventure in Kindness and Muddy Paws. Eva is an ABC correspondent and co-host of Good Morning America, Weekend Edition. Eva is building her life and career on kindness. From a young age, Eva's mom taught her that kind was the best thing she could be, and Eva still lives by that philosophy. Eva and her colleagues at Good Morning America have developed a hashtag nice girls movement, and she believes that it makes the newsroom a happier place and that it produces better work. She wants young people to know that kindness is a strength, and we all have an opportunity to make the world brighter one action at a time. Welcome, Eva, thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Walter Does His Best, your children's book. Thanks for having me. (laughs) It's my pleasure. Yes, I've read this now several times to my kids, and they are huge fans. So thank you for, you know, spicing up our bedtime last night and other (laughs) nights. I appreciate it. (laughs) They were, they were like over the moon excited that Walter was actually your dog, which they did not realize at first. So. Well, and some of the stories in that book are actual real life Walter stories. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I was like, you guys, Walter has his own Instagram account. They're like, no way. (laughs) It's because my husband was like, you can't just keep posting pictures of your dog. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He's somewhere running around. I'm not sure where he is at the moment. (laughs) I had to cut myself off. I'm like, I can't post my dog more than like it once a week or something. (laughs) I have a limit. I'm like, okay, he's, he's been in the squares. Like he's in like three of the five. I need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tell listeners what Walter does his best is, is about and what inspired you to write this children's book. Um, it's about kindness ultimately. And I think about the fact that we're all imperfect. Oh, there, there's Walter. And- <laughs> <laughs> I see him like in the back corner. Oh, <laughs> hold on. He, he was in his wigwam. He he goes there when he's not getting attention. And he's oh my gosh! Can I take a screenshot of this? Hold on. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Hold on. One, um, two, three. Okay, love it. Oh my god, so, so cute. Okay, where he expects to have attention like right away, and so he he's a little angry that I didn't cuddle him and rub his belly. Uh, He's very spoiled. But ultimately the book is about Walter and the joy that I saw that he was giving to people as he was trying to like do these, like, you know, dogs very much are like trying to do good things to like please people and make them happy. And as I was watching him, it was the early stages of the pandemic. I just was like amazed at like how people responded to him. And how they in turn responded to me, which was really nice. I mean, you live in New York, so you know, like when you walk around with no dog, nobody even notices you exist, but all of a sudden you have a dog and like, it is this sort of like magical thing where you start to have these interactions with people. And so we were writing down some of the funny things that Walter does that, you know, he's not perfect. He's a little bit of a hot mess. We have tried to train him. I know it doesn't seem that way. (laughs) But he has a mind of his own. And so, yeah, so that was kind of just the whole idea. And my husband and I at the time were trying to get pregnant. I'm like nine months pregnant now. Oh my gosh. Yay. (laughs) Any moment now, every little movement that happens, I'm like, is this going to be it? (laughs) Uh, But we were talking about, okay, what's most important to us as we start to think about what do we want to, how do we want to shape the life of our daughter? And what lessons do we want to make sure, like, what are our, like, must have things, you know? And the thing we kept talking about was kindness. Like, you don't want your kid to be a jerk. (laughs) And that would be the one thing that would like really upset us if we found out she was mean to some other child or to some other person. And so Walter seemed like this great avenue as a way to talk about kindness with kids. And so as I was writing down his stories, it just turned into this book. Not all the stories in the book are real life Walter stories, but several of them actually are. (laughs) (laughs) To your point on kindness and wanting your kids to be nice. I have four kids of my own and I have to say they've been through so much stuff, all of them. 
And I have had such emotions that accompany all the stuff, all the good stuff and bad stuff that's happened to them. However, the time I think I've been most upset myself was when one of my kids did something to someone else. And that made me like want to vomit. Like I was beside myself. Like how could I raise a child who would do X, Y, Z and whatever. Anyway, it ended up being an aberration. Not that you're worried, but. Yeah, well, and you know, the thing is, I, re- I have vivid memories of my mother who like, that was the thing she cared about the most, right? She, I mean, she wanted us to be smart. I have like a crazy Korean tiger mom for a mom, but she wanted us to do well in school, but she also really wanted us to be nice. And I remember one time as a child in elementary school, I wasn't outrightly mean to someone, but I remember I was dismissive of them and kind of ignored them. And my mother had this very long conversation with me about how that wasn't okay and that I needed to go rectify it and make it right and to make sure that person felt included. And that was a memory that has stayed with me into my adult life. Like I, I remember how bad I felt and how the disappointment that my mother had because of how I behave really changed how I interacted with other kids going forward. So you you sort of just want that, that message where kids are paying attention to how other kids around them are feeling, you know, it's like, notice this, this child over here is by themselves and they look lonely and they're very quiet. And maybe you should go over there and be their friend. And that small act of kindness could be huge in that other person's life. You know, that's what you want, right? Like you want them to be that person. (laughs) Totally. My husband and I say to my, I don't know why we only say this to my daughter. We should say it to all of the kids. But anyway, whenever she's like worried about school or anything, we're just like, okay, well today in school, you have to make someone else smile. Like come home and tell us how you did it. Like make someone else's day good. So I don't know. I think also just taking them out of themselves. Like kids worry about so much stuff themselves and there's so much going on all the time. So focusing on other people's feelings from the beginning, it just can't hurt. Yeah. No, that's such a good thing. Make someone else smile. I have to remember that. (laughs) Yeah. Parenting hacks 101. You know, I I could go on. We could have a whole conversation about what to do with with this child of yours about to be born. But I will say, I also had a dog when I brought home one of my older, one of my later kids. And it was not always, it's not always like the most easy to acclimate the dog and and the, and the baby situation. So I don't know why I, I remember I saw this woman who said like, get a doll. And so we like got a doll before we had the kids and to get the, to get the dog, like used to having a baby and baby crying. So we got a doll that like made these crying sounds, and, which was so annoying. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm sitting here like massively pregnant, like holding onto a baby doll, like listening to the baby doll fake cry to train my dog to not attack my child. Like this is insanity and I'm just going to own it right now. We've been playing YouTube videos of crying babies, trying to get him used to the <laughs> screaming noise because <laughs> he doesn't like it. I mean, it's- yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't like it either. <laughs> I feel like, why am I subjecting myself to this before I actually have to endure it? <laughs> and it's so much worse in person, not to scare you, but you know, <laughs> When it's your own child and your heart is also breaking a little bit and feeling like you're responsible for the crying, that's even worse. But anyway, back to the book. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So you have a dog, you want to in- inculcate sort of the sense of kindness and all of that, but why, when did this become an actual project for you? It was, I started working on it. It was like March, April, 2020, like right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was crazy. And the world just sort of slowed down, which is how that element of, you know, Walter does his best kind of folded in because you know, we were all doing our best. <laughs> it was like a little bit of a hot mess, I think for everyone. And yeah, so I had a little bit of time where I wasn't traveling and I had some time to think. And we had talked about doing this, shortly before then, but to actually have a moment to breathe. And it was this happy place for me. I would like sit outside in our little backyard and, and it was like kind of cold, but I was under a blanket, like writing down these ideas and playing with Walter. So it was a way for me to escape in the middle of the pandemic as well. So, you know, a (laughs) win-win. 
a win-win. And Walter is now, you know, famous for all mankind. <laughs> so what happened between growing up with a tiger mom and now? Like, how did you get onto GMA? And like, how did you decide on this path? It was kind of an accident. I mean, anyone with a Korean tiger mom knows that they mostly want you to either go like very stable careers, like doctor, lawyer, or something like with a predictable path. I was supposed to go to med school. I was, you know, doing, a, I had a background in science and was doing chemistry and nutrition. And I started doing websites in college. And I was always interested in journalism. I was like on my high school newspaper, you know, but I was very curious as a child. And this sort of like felt normal and natural. And I liked talking to people. And so next thing I knew, I was like working at a TV station. One of my friends was like, we have a job, come work here. So I went and worked in West Virginia. I went from West Virginia to Charlotte, to Indianapolis, to Philadelphia, like as a local news reporter and anchor. And then a bunch of women got pregnant all at the same time. And ABC needed a female correspondent. (laughs) And that's kind of like how it started for me. I came up and have been really blessed to have gotten to travel the world and see history as it happens, like with my own two eyes, which I think is so special to know, you know, exactly what was happening in front of me, not someone else's filter of how it was happening. And I've traveled all over the place. I mean, I've done live shots like in front of the Eiffel Tower and then, and all over the country from like tiny, tiny towns across America. So it's been this really life changing experience when you get to meet so many different people and see so many places. I'm super, super grateful for it. Wow. That's amazing. What's like a moment in history that might, what felt a little different to you actually being there than we might've seen on TV? I mean, you know, it's interesting. Cause I, we, I, I sort of, it sounds weird to say it this way, but I sort of made my way through the ranks of correspondent covering natural disasters and tragedies. I remember at one point, some guy on in maybe Virginia, I think it was after Charlottesville was like, when, when I see you show up, you're like the angel of death. And I was like, Oh no, he wants to be that. (laughs) And he was like, but it's always something bad happens where they send you. And, and that's, that wasn't untrue. I was covering hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, you know, mass tragedies. But the thing that was really interesting and has been interesting for me is you would be amazed at the, the just love that people show each other in these really horrible moments. I mean, you see the worst of people, but you also see the very best of them. And I'm so grateful that I get to see that and be reminded of that all the time, that we have that goodness and kindness in us. And maybe we don't show it to our neighbors every day, but when our neighbors when we're all in like a really bad situation where people have just lost everything they own in a hurricane you see people sharing when they have nothing to share. And there's something really special about that. And I think that's something that people never get to see. You know, we try to portray that on television, but to see it and feel it and hug those people, like there's just something amazing about it. Wow. That's really inspiring. How do you not have PTSD yourself from seeing all the stuff? Or maybe you do. I think it stays with you a little bit, but I mean, I think it's the good that you see in people that inspires you to, you know, want to do more and do better and be grateful every day that today is not your worst day. You know what I mean? It puts things into perspective. And I think that like grounds you in a way that like few other things really can. I love what you just said. Be grateful today that today is not your worst day. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's it. That's like the best way to live through life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, it could be a lot worse. It could be a lot worse. Yes. That's (laughs) the flip side. Yes, exactly. Oh my gosh. Wow. And so how, how did the process work with the book and the illustrator and, you know, making it into a, a finished product and Was that really exciting? Tell me about that. It was different than anything I've ever done before. I tell stories for a living, right? But telling Walter's story was, you know, you're trying to kind of think, how am I going to put this together? And the pictures do say and do so much, right? So we started off, it was actually supposed to be kind of like, I think more of like a sweet story that rhymed. And as I was drawing inspiration from the real Walter, it kind of, he's, I'm not funny at all. He's very funny. (laughs) And so the things he were, he was doing, people were laughing at. And so 
we talked about like what we wanted those pictures to look like and how we built off of his own kind of humor and natural personality and making sure that kind of shine through. And the rhyme went away because it was just taking away from being able to really showcase those things. And they, we had these Zoom calls and I mean, Walter's mad at me right now. So he's in his wigwam, but Walter would show up on the Zoom call. So everyone that's part of the team that worked on it <laughs> to see Walter being really bad. <laughs> and um, I think that helps, you know, to sort of, oh, I, I, I know how he would look or what he would do or how his body would move or, you know what I mean? To sort of inspire it as we you know, sort of started to talk about what we want the pictures to look like. And Jessica Gibson, the illustrator, so fantastic. I mean, the pictures of Walter and the chaos. So, I mean, she's just brilliant. I mean, they make the story, I think. Yeah, they're awesome. Really amazing. And it looks like him, doesn't it? I mean, it totally looks like him. It's like, you know, poor Walter, just like everything. He's like this sort of hapless, (laughs) you know, Always wanting to do his best, but messing everything up, which I relate to (laughs) myself. I'll do. (laughs) So what is next for you? You're having a baby. Like what's on the horizon? Are you going to step back from work for a while? Are you going to like, do you have big term, big long-term sort of career goals or like you've already achieved so much? What are you thinking? Yeah. So the babies do like any day now, allegedly. My due date is like coming up, I think next week. So yeah, I'll, I'll probably be out for a bit doing maternity leave and trying to figure my way (laughs) as you do with a new baby. And Walter will hopefully like her. That's what we're hoping for. And then I'll come back kind of, the plan is to come back kind of part-time and ease my way back into it. Cause I do travel a lot for work. And so I'm just going to dip my toe back in and then slip. I'm very lucky. I work for Disney and we have a great package that they give us to sort of acclimate us for maternity leave and for family bonding to make sure that, you know, the family unit is important. So I'm very grateful for that. And I realize like not all women get that, but I'm planning to fully take advantage of it. So then come back and we'll see what happens. I still have like long form, like documentary style pieces that I'm have my fingers in that are in the works. So hopefully none of them have to go to air while I'm gone, but, (laughs) but I've been trying to tie up all the loose ends. I think like anyone who's ever been pregnant and knows that they have to go on leave. It's like trying to do all the projects and finish them up, or at least pass them off, like in the best place. It's like checklist every day of all the things that I want to make sure everyone else knows when I'm not you know, easily accessible. (laughs) Wow. Well, good luck. I think at least that'll bring another book, perhaps, you know, Walter gets a a baby sister or something. (laughs) Just keep this going. (laughs) So what advice would you have for aspiring authors, particularly of picture books? You know, I had a high school teacher tell me once, write what you know. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's the best advice. Like as I was sitting there thinking, what am I going to, how am I going to tell this story? It, it dawned on me right away. I know my dog. Uh, he is funny. He's He gives me a lot of laughs and joy. And I think that's kind of the thing, like when you write what you know, even if it's not like a hundred percent real life, but you know that very well, it, it it's easier. It comes more simply. Got it. Awesome. Amazing. Well, Eva, thank you. Thanks for sharing Walter with us and making me feel very grateful that my current dog happens to be particularly well behaved, <laughs> but that has not always been the case. Yeah. I did have, I had a bulldog who I had to get a stroller for and would never, ever, ever walk. Yeah. So I know every day, every dog time walk. this dog actually walks, I'm like thrilled. So <laughs> all dogs like to walk. They do not. <laughs> they do not. No, they do not. I think my old dog had like a major anxiety disorder or something. I don't know. He wouldn't go. She wouldn't go anywhere. Anyway, long time ago. But thank you for this book. Thanks for sharing your story and best of luck with your with your new baby. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for reading the book to your kids. Oh, yeah. It will not be the last time I do that. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 